um, in order to try to uh, reach people more about, um, about oceans and kind of engage them in the story of uh, what is important about the oceans and, and really intrigue people, um, one of the things that uh, we've produced in conjunction with World Wildlife Fund is a new website that we've called Marine Mysteries. And um, so this is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the pages there looking at um, jumbo squid and uh, why they're moving into BC waters and what the implications of that is. <clears throat> and uh, a key part of our website as well is our Oceans Book Club. And in a way, what you are participating in here tonight is the launch of, um, public launch of the, the website and our book club. And the first book that we are featuring on this Oceans Book Club is in fact um, Alana Mitchell's book, Seasick. <clears throat> So what I'd like to do is um, give you a brief introduction to Alana, um, and I'll do it from a more personal perspective, because Alana and I have uh, known each other for a number of years uh, since she was a journalist uh, with the uh, Globe and Mail uh, newspaper. And, um, and, uh, and also since then, we've also, we also have a number of mutual friends who work in kind of the wilderness uh, environmental field. And uh, in fact, we're both part of a, a little coven actually called Witches for Wilderness. <laughs> and uh, we even have the t-shirts to prove it. Um, now, uh, Alana and I haven't been on one of the uh, trips together that the witches have done. And I actually think it's time that the coven got together again. But we actually, through our mutual friends, have, uh, um, have had some fun uh, as a group of women who uh, love wilderness, care deeply about it. And, um, and I have actually, I, I was hearing through some of our, my witches' friends that Alana had been working on this book. I'd been hearing about them talking about this and I kept saying, oh, Alana, please, like, finish this book because we need you to help us get the message out that the oceans are in trouble and that we need people to help us do something about what's happening to the oceans. So, Alana, we are so thrilled that your book is out and that you're here tonight to tell us about it. And I'd like to invite you to come up and tell us more. So, so I thought I would talk to you a little bit about, about seasick and about its birth because it's, it, it's not, um, I find, you know, People have been asking me, I'm, this book has only been out for about a month, just under a month, and in Canada, it's out in, it was out in Australia in September where it actually has been selling like hotcakes, strangely enough, if you, if you can believe. And um, so, so, but people have been asking me why I wrote this book, as if, so I, I guess, as if I had um, an advocacy agenda. And in fact, strangely enough, I didn't. I, that's just not my bent. I'm trained as a journalist. I'm a, I'm a specialist in, uh, academically in Latin literature and English literature. This is, of all things, uh, that, that, those are my, my degrees. And um, I think what it really goes back to is that um, I grew up in a family of scientists. My dad is a biologist. He was one of the very first biologists um, in the prairies. Uh, in, uh, in fact, he was the first biologist in uh, in. Alberta, the first provincial biologist, and set up a lot of the, the ideas about how biologists thought about, about ecosystems there. He was one of the original ecologists. And so we just sort of had this stuff at our, at, at our table. I mean, my, some of my fondest memories of childhood were, well, I can't say fondest. Some of my memories of childhood um, were, you know, every summer we were getting one of his terrible old station wagons. You know those ones? This is in the 60s. And they never had air conditioning. And we were always on some little bumpy gravel or dirt road off on the prairie somewhere, always on our way to visit my grandmother in Gibson's Landing. But we were always on some, some quest or other for my dad to find out something about how this ecosystem of the prairies worked because that's where he that was his his discipline he taught at the University of Regina and uh, so, so I, I can remember I remember one summer actually with my baby brother in the front seat this is long before child seats and long before we had um, seat belts and even longer before we had plastic diapers and my mother sat there with the one-year-old you know in the diaper pail at her feet um, as we bumped over these things and my dad was off on a quest to, to see how something worked and so I think that's that's really where my what what drives me for me it's just intellectual curiosity so when i first met sabina and was you know met some of the other people in this room i was working at the globe and mail um where i worked for 14 years um i was in it was in calgary and i started looking at national parks and uh, and uh, uh david anderson might remember this part <laughs> um but we uh but we we used to 
I was, I was writing about those and, and just wanted to understand again how this ecosystem works. And I got to the end of writing my very first book about this stuff, which was all about, you know, hotspots, ecological hotspots on land and what was happening to the world. And I was really proud of this book and it was my first thing and I really thought I got it all figured out. I felt like I was my dad, you know, who'd gone around all over the world and fit together all these pieces and had it all worked out. And very end of the trip, I was in Galapagos because there was a substantial Darwin theme in this book. And I was in the Galapagos on my book. Uh, um, I, was, I was writing the book at this point, I was, and this is the very final journey for it. And I was bunking with uh, Sylvia Earle, who is, uh, does anybody know Sylvia Earle? Sylvia Earle is one of the most famous marine biologists in the world. She's a wonderful deep water explorer. And uh, she was at one point head of NOAA and has been, has forever been, you know, had, has had a place in my heart because she's known as her deepness, <laughs> and I, I and, and I was bunking with her. I was on a I was on a, a a research trip with some people from Conservation International, and she is with Conservation International or was at that time. And they were trying. The ocean was such a remote part of any any thinking in the conservation world at that time. That would have been in about uh, 2004, 2003. Um, as as an ecosystem, it was it was fairly remote. That. Sylvia Earle was trying to persuade the, the board of directors of Conservation International, which is a big U.S. group um, on conservation, t to actually think about preserving parts of the global ocean. So this, this, and so it was very, it was all very new. And I was bunking with her, and I was very intimidated by her because she like has this huge reputation, and she's written all these books, and she's just, you know, you kind of, you know, you kind of, you know go like this and here I was bunking with her and, and I, I know she was doing a lot of experiments while we were there and I, I, uh, it, our whole bunk room was filled with all these elec little electronic uh, pieces of equipment plugged in, you know, and I was, I was quite intimidated by it and until finally one day I, I tiptoed over and looked at one and realized it was her set of hair curlers <laughs> and, um, and, and relaxed enough to really go up and talk to her and I said to her, you're a biologist but why a marine biologist, what, what's, you know, why? And she said, well, my dear, that's where most of the life is. And I was right at the end of writing this book that I thought, the first one called Dancing at the Dead Sea, that I thought had put together all these pieces, and I realized that I really knew nothing about how the world worked, about how my planet worked. So I published the first book and went off on a quest, another quest, again, around the world, because I'd gone around the world for the first book as well. And j just, to, just because I, I had to understand how the ocean worked. So it wasn't, it wasn't uh, that I was trying to figure out how sick the sea was. It wasn't that I was trying to figure out, you know, what the next, as I was accused at the Globe of, uh, you know, the next little um, parcel of Armageddon I could write about. It, it was <laughs> simply that I wanted to understand how it worked. And what I discovered absolutely shocked me, um, both because I had never, as a, what I, I came to think of myself as a terrestrial dolt, I had never really thought about how the ocean gives us life, and not just gives us um, fish, or gives us seafood, or gives us, you know, um, that kind of stuff, but how everything about our lives is dependent on the ocean working in a normal way, in the in normal meaning, the way that it worked when we evolved. So I'm thinking about geological time here. And so what I discovered first off is that 99% of the living space in the planet is in the global ocean. And there's just one ocean, by the way. It's not a lot of oceans. <laughs> it's a single system. It is one ocean. And it it contains 99% of the living space on the planet. And th even that just took me, it took me like weeks, maybe months to just absorb this. And then I discovered, of course, that it, um, that it uh, controls the climate because, and it controls the oxygen cycles. So every second breath of oxygen you take is oxygen from plankton. So it, and it controls the carbon cycle, therefore the climate. <laughs> As one scientist put it to me, if everything on land were to die tomorrow, the ocean would be just fine. But if everything in the ocean died tomorrow, everything on land would also die. For most of the Earth's, Earth's time, there has been only life in the ocean. We are latecomers to the planet. So it was just trying to put all these pieces together and understand how the currents worked and how the chemistry worked that got me thinking about it. So. The first thing I did was go, I, I, I found a fabulous researcher whose name is Nancy Knowlton. She works now in, in DC at the Smithsonian Institution. Um, but I, I, I knew that she was a, a really great 
talker. She could really write and talk. And I read a bunch of her papers. And I just emailed her out of the blue, which is what you do with scientists if you want to get them. You just email them. And they're probably in China or someplace. And you know they get back to you in 10 seconds, because they're always hooked up at, you know 24-7. So I emailed her. And she was indeed in China, or possibly Japan. And, and I said, you know, I'm interested in writing this book. Would you be interested in helping me? Could I come? Could I tag along on a trip? And she said, sure, no problem. These are the 17 p places I'm going in the next two months for research. <laughs> I'm joking. But she, there were three really big ones in the next three months. And she said, which one would you like to come on? And one of them was a coral spawning. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. Know nothing about it. What the heck's a coral? But I think I'll go. So I met her in Panama and, uh, several months later and um, went on a coral spawning, which is truly, I don't, has anybody here ever been to a coral spawning? Anybody in the room? No? It's, they call it one of, I'm sorry? A herring spawn. Look, well, I'm sure that's majestic. <laughs> But coral spawns are truly one of one of the great wonders of the natural world. I mean, I think scientists are fairly, you know, unanimous on this one. And we've only even known that coral spawn, you know, for the last 20 years or so. It was just discovered in the off chance in uh, on the Great Barrier Reef. It was one of these great mysteries, you know, how do corals reproduce? Because they don't move, you know, how do they, you know, what's what's the? Well, it turns out that what corals, the way corals reproduce the ones that I was looking at anyway, and this is fairly common for different species, but the ones I was looking at reproduce by doing a mass spawn, um, all of them across the Caribbean at the same moment. In this case, the case of the ones I was looking at, it was 100 minutes after sunset, um, after the biggest harvest moon, after the harvest moon of summer. 100 minutes. So all of these little creatures, they don't even have brains. They're just like ectoplasm on top of these nice, you know, these coral structures. Somehow know in, in ways that are so precise that we can't even measure them. Humans have just figured this out and we still have trouble figuring out when corals are going to spawn in ways so precise that they, that they actually know what to do so that they can, that they can reproduce. And so in this case, I went down to Panama and, uh, and, you know, we hung, there were about, you know, 25 PhDs and then with their scuba suits and me with my snorkel and I'm hanging there at midnight <laughs> watching, you know, waiting for these corals to spawn and waiting because we, you know, we had to be there for several nights before and then several nights after just because, you know, if you miss it, it's, it's you know, you're, it's, it's game over, you know, for that year. They only do it once a year. So uh, we, we got there and we looked uh, and it's, and for a couple of nights beforehand, nothing was happening. The reef was quiet but we were monitoring it anyway. And the night that it happened, you literally, literally could put a toe in the water of the Caribbean, and it was something like, you know, some extraordinary temperature, like 36 degrees or something. I mean, it was an incredibly warm <laughs> little part of the, of the Caribbean that year, and it was a bad year for bleaching. But you could put your toe in, and you could literally feel the sexual electricity just, you know, just raging through this <laughs> coral reef. I mean, it was an orgy. <laughs> It's just unbelievable. Everything was breeding, and whatever wasn't breeding was eating um, what, the stuff. And so it was this very, very extraordinary time. And I, I remember just feeling. And then we took, you know, we took little bits back to the, back to the lab that's set up there as part of the Smithsonian's um, uh, Smithsonian Institution's lab down in Panama. On, in Bocas del Toro. So we took all these little bits and pieces of the spawn that we caught in plankton nets down to the lab and sat up all night waiting f to see how many of them would reproduce and looking at them under these microscopes. And, you know, I sort of became a lab tech for the evening. And, um, and it, was, it, was, it was just magnificent. It was one of those, it, this was a ritual of reproduction, the, the essence of reproduction in life, right, in, in the world. And here are these creatures that are probably 450 million years old or so. They've been doing this magnificent ritual for all these years. And just to witness it, kind of, well, it got the, the obsession deeper, let me say. So um, I, I, I just got launched. I wrote a chapter about it, um, sold the rights to the book uh, in different parts of the world, and, and, and kept going, kept going through some sort of insane you know, need, obsession to understand how all this stuff worked. So the next thing I went to was, um, and, and of course as I went, I realized that things were not just as they should be, but the, the next thing really brought it home. This was a, a thing that they call the blob. And uh, it's, I, I hitched a ride on a research ship that was going for 11 extremely lengthy days um, <clears throat> in a closed ship. Uh, 
in the, the Gulf of Mexico looking at this thing that is called a dead zone. And, it's, and they call it the blob because it's completely unmixable. And it reappears every spring when the farmers up and down the Mississippi uh, fertilize their, their crops. And some of the fertilizer runs off down the Mississippi and goes off into the Gulf of Mexico. And, and fertilizes, of course, all the plants that live in the, in the, all the plankton, the phytoplankton that live in the Gulf of Mexico on the surface. So it, they go nuts, talk about an orgy. These things go crazy. They eat and eat and reproduce and reproduce, and then they fall, they die, fall to the bottom of, of the seabed in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, bacteria take over and decompose them and use up the oxygen as they're decomposing them. So what you get is, is from the bottom of the seabed up, because this blob spreads, you get this zone that has almost no oxygen. And when there's no oxygen, very little can live there. Nothing that needs oxygen can live there, let's say. So you get the odd jellyfish. In fact, sometimes you get a heck of a lot of jellyfish, but because uh, they don't use up a lot of oxygen, they store it. But, you, but the year I was there, which was in 2005, this thing was 17,000 square kilometers. Mm -hmm in area, and that doesn't count the volume, because in some parts it went right from the seabed up to the surface. And literally there were days and days and days when we saw not a fish, we saw not a mosquito. It was just like there was nothing living in this thing. And then you would go outside, and we were testing all the time to see what was there chemically and what was there in terms of life. And as soon as we went out of the dead zone and into a part of the, of the gulf that still had oxygen, it, of course, it was just teeming with life. It was just thriving. So th this, be, you know, this, this sort of was a microcosm of some of the things that can go wrong with the global ocean. It's one of the, the one in the Gulf of Mexico is one of more than 400 dead zones in the uh, global ocean. And so trying to understand them and how they spread is a really interesting thing. <coughs> they're doubling um, every decade at least, the number is doubling, and they're, each one is getting bigger. But the really scary thing is that dead zones like that one, there are now three that we know of in the world that are being caused, including one off the coast of Oregon, that are being caused simply by changes to the climate. So they're just being changed. They're just being, um, the changes to the temperature and the current structure are creating these huge dead zones in. Um, in current structures, which is which is really frightening because it's not it's not a, a case then of just not putting in chemicals as it may be in the Gulf of Mexico and the, and in some of the other dead zones. This is a case of it's a dead zone because concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are too high. So it's it's really really hard to change that, and it's really hard to know at what point uh, things will tip over into another state and these dead zones will spread. So th it's one of those great, uh, terrifying mysteries of the, 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 that are happening right now with the, with the global ocean. And it, of course, they may not, they may not spread. But the fact that there's uh, that there's a possibility that they might spread is quite is quite alarming. So, so there was the the blob, and then I decided I wanted to look at pH. And does, do people here know about the pH issue in the global ocean? Just for just for interest, we've got one. We've got a bunch of people who know about the the pH issue. I didn't know about the pH issue. I I had read the first big paper that came out on it, came out in 2005. It was it was by the Royal Society. It was just as I was beginning the research for this book. I really had no idea what a serious issue it was, and I actually had that Royal Society paper with me on the on the trip to Panama, I was reading it and showing it to the scientists and saying, did you guys know about this? And they said, well, actually, no, we didn't know about this. So I started looking at it. And what, that, what it means is that about a third of the, of the carbon dioxide that we've, the ancient carbon dioxide that we've put into the atmosphere, atmosphere through burning fossil plants and animals, which we call fossil fuels, about a third of that has been absorbed into the global ocean. So we know already that CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere are altering the global climate. We can see that you know, in our own backyards. But what scientists haven't really understood until quite recently is that about a third of that CO2 is being absorbed into the global ocean. This is not something you can change. It's like if I breathe something into my lungs, it is going to go into my blood system. It's not that you can stop this. It's part of the way the system works. So as it goes in, at the CO2 goes into the, is absorbed into the, into the ocean, it, it's chemically active and it makes it reacts with marine water, salt water, to, to make a, a mild carbonic acid. So what that does is lower the pH. It's, so it's an increasing acidifica acidification of the, of the global ocean at the surface, not all the way through, but at the surface where a lot of the life is. So I started looking at this. I, I, went, to, 
I started wondering if it mattered, you know, as, as, as one does. I'm, I'm thinking, okay, so pH is changing, like, does it, can it matter? Can it really matter that much? It's not even a huge change. It's only like about 0.15 of a unit. And I, I, I started kind of thinking about this. So I went down to Puerto Rico to a conference of scientists where they were trying to figure out what, this is a NOAA conference. So this is the scientific community of, of the US government. They're trying to figure out what parts of the, of the, what indicators, what sort of vital signs of health of the ocean to monitor in a, a little bay off Puerto Rico. So they're putting in this, this big, this big expensive, you know, monitor, just like, you know, like governments do, right? And I went down to, because a couple of the best um, scientists on acidity were going to be there, and they were trying to convince their own government to, to monitor pH, which wasn't an expensive thing. It, was, it wasn't more expensive than putting up this enormous uh, watchtower that they were going to, you know, in fact, there was one guy there who said, oh, let's listen to the, let's listen to the chattering of, of the fish, because that'll tell us quite a bit about the the, uh, the health of the reef, and and that got a really positive response compared to the scientists I was talking to who were saying, let's monitor pH. It was just like, why? Why would we monitor pH? What's the issue? And this was in 2006, so this is quite a recent, and this was the US, Puerto Rico, but it was still, these were US scientists. But still, and I was asking the same questions, why does it matter? And they explained to me that the, why it, the reason it matters is that when the pH gets to a certain level, gets lower than it is now, um, what it does is it, me it means that creatures that need calcium, need to use calcium to make their shells, including a lot of the plankton, can't get access to the calcium. So they have thinner shells and they use more energy trying to make their shells. And at some point when the, when the ocean becomes acidic enough, they simply, um, the, this, the shells simply dissolve. So this is a huge issue. And again, I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, okay, so some things won't be able to make calcium shells, like maybe it's not such a big deal, why do we care about this? And, and, and I, I talked to one of the scientists, whose name is Joni Kleipas. She's one of the great scientists on this. She works in Colorado. And, she, and I said, why does it matter? And she said, well, because those are calcifiers. And not only are calcifiers throughout the food chain incredibly important, they're also, they're also important to plankton. And I said, why plankton? And she said, well, a lot of the plankton have calcium carbonate shells, limestone shells, like the White Cliffs of Dover. Those are the shells of ancient um, coccolithophores, or a type of plankton that produce a tremendous amount of, of um, oxygen. And not only do they produce oxygen, they store carbon dioxide. So they're right at the very bottom of the food chain in the ocean, but they're also at the very top of what's known as the biogeochemical cycle of the ocean. So they control carbon, they, they, they are carbon sinks, they control oxygen, they control nitrogen. So if they start to fail to thrive, what happens to all of the rest of the stuff? And they don't know. They wish they did. They're running some experiments, but right now they just simply don't know what, what's going to happen to these things. And that is a problem. And when Joni, uh, Joni said when she first figured it out, she was with, uh, with a bunch of other scientists at a big meeting, and they just sort of did some did some calculations on the back of, a, of an envelope. And she said when they, when they actually sat down and realized what was happening and where this was going to go if we don't lower concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, she said she ran into the bathroom next door and threw up. Like, it's, it's an incredibly serious <laughs> phenomenon. It's not something that we can just sort of sniffle at. And there are people um, in the scientific community who understand this, and there are people who are still not too clear on it, but in general, certainly if you look to Europe, this is something that is very well understood. In fact, in in England, they call um, they call ocean acidification the evil twin of global climate change. It's it's part of the problem, but it's a bigger problem because it affects a bigger part of the ecosystem of the planet. So, uh, you know, what do you do with that? Um, I went to look at more plankton, of course. I went to Plymouth, which is one of the places where they've looked at, at plankton for a great number of years and um, have been tracking them. And what I found was really terrifying because they are able to track plankton through recorders. So they've, they've been doing this for 75 years with these little old machines that they pay, you know, ships 50 pounds a piece to drag behind them. And what they're finding is that some of the plankton have moved. So plankton that used to be more down by the Mediterranean are now further up toward England. And the plankton that used to be up at England are now further north. And in itself, that's not such a big deal, necessarily. Except that the plankton that have come from the south 
are in the north in numbers that are roughly 70% lower than the other plankton used to be. So, and something, you know, there are other things that may fill in those spaces, like there's now space for other, other plankton to evolve and maybe they'll evolve really quickly, but the fact that they're not there now and the fact that, they're, that plankton as a whole are under such stress is really scary. And of course, they're moving with temperature and they're moving with, with other things of, uh, that, that affect life in the ocean. One of the, the in, in Plymouth, they have a really fantastic um, aquarium. It's one of the oldest in the world. And they put up a new building in 1998. It's a big, glorious, you know, oceanfront building, very fancy, biggest in, in England, and they are quite proud of it. When it, when it opened in 1998, its, it's um, piece de résistance was a Mediterranean tank. So it's a, a, you know, full of all these Mediterranean things. I was there in 2007, and they can no longer call it the Mediterranean tank. Why? Because almost everything that's in that tank now lives in the Plymouth Sound. So that's in 10 years. <laughs> and, that's, uh, and of course, that kind of thing is happening. That kind of thing is happening along with all sorts of, that movement of species is happening all over the, all over the global ocean. So things are happening quite quickly. So what you've got there, when you look at it, is you've got zones that don't have oxygen. You've got increased warmth in the ocean. You've got risen, risen temperatures. You've got um, a pH that's, that's altering that if we don't change things, we'll, by about 2050, we'll have severed the creatures that live in the ocean from their evolutionary history, meaning that the pH will be so low that it will be lower than anything that existed when the creatures that are now in the ocean first evolved. Okay, so that's that's called an evolutionary disconnect, and it's scientists don't like this stuff. <laughs> they don't like these disconnects because it, it what it means is that life in the ocean is under threat. Nobody knows exactly how it's going to respond. Nobody knows exactly species by species how everything will do, and they're running some experiments on this stuff. They'll probably never figure it out because it, there are just too many species in the ocean. But they know that it's something that is really, um, it sets the table for uh, a mass extinction on the planet, okay? That's just what they don't like. So I thought I would, um, I thought I would tell you now a little bit about hope because I think there is some <laughs> and I know it's hard to find. I know by the time I got to the end of this research, I, I really um, I re was really in despair. I think I went to bed for about a month. So what I, what I ended up doing was going to the bottom of the ocean because this, this again was my obsession. I just needed to be in the ocean. I needed to see what it was like. And the way I chose to do that was to go down in a submersible, um, which is a hard thing to book. You, it takes years to get this. Like you can't just sort of, you know, you know, book it. It's you can't go on Expedia or something. Like it's really tough to get one of these things. In fact, there are only uh, there's only a couple of dozen in the world that go down as deep as as the one I wanted to go down in. And so I f I rounded up, and and most of them, in fact, now they send down robots because it's too dangerous for humans to go down. So um, this this particular one, I, uh, I I had made arrangements to go down in, and it was off the coast of Florida, in the uh, just above Cuba, in the waters there, and I, I really had to trudge to get there. I really had to, I, I thought, you know, what difference does it make if I do one more journey? I mean, t for this book, I really, at that point, considered not writing the book at all, because I really thought, how, it, it's, it, this is not a good picture. All the vital signs, everything that, you know, a doctor would look at, you know, to, to, to examine the health of this organism called the global ocean, all of those signs are going in the wrong way. So why does it matter? And, and I, I just sort of made myself do it because it had been so hard, so fiddly to set up and hard to do. And I got on this, uh, this boat and um, start, you know, you, know, you have to, you know, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of rules about going on to these things. They tell you quite a lot about what you can and can't do. And uh, I was taking notes pretty furiously, you know, this is about five in the morning, and I get out, and I haven't actually even seen the submersible that I'm going to get into. I haven't actually set eyes on it, but I know I'm going to get into it and go to 3,000 feet um, to, the, to the bottom of the sea, to a part of the ocean that no one has ever seen before. Literally, no one had ever clapped eyes on this before. Mm -hmm. And by this time, I'm... The, the despair piece is kind of gone. You know, by this point, I'm right in terror. <laughs> and I'm standing there holding all my blankets and things because it's very cold in this thing. 
uh, and they've told us to bulk up on blankets. So I'm holding all my blankets, you know, like a, a woebegone little girl, sort of looking up at this thing, this hatch that I have to climb up into. And this, the chief scientist of the expedition who it, it comes over, and she's a wonderful, wonderful woman. Her name is Shirley Pomponi. And she's a terrific, terrific scientist. And she says to me, so how are you doing? And I say, I'm really, really scared. Well, Shirley's a great scientist, but sadly not a psychotherapist. And <laughs> she proceeds to explain to me in very great detail how the last people died in this <laughs> little chamber I'm just about to put my life into. And uh, it all had to do, of course, with the composition of the atmosphere in the, in the chamber. And, uh, and, and I thought, okay, I, I can't think about this anymore. And I just, I just marched myself up, up into the hatch, got into the hatch, and I had to lie down to fit. This is not a big space. We're talking, I came to think of it as like two bathtubs, you know, those old-fashioned bathtubs, one on top of the other. It's not, it's not a big space. I'm not a huge person, and I could not certainly sit up. I had to lie down in this thing, and I'm lying there with another, with the engineer, the guy who's keeping us all alive, the one who's organizing the, the, uh, the levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen and for, for the, whole, the whole thing. And he gets in there. And uh, he explains to me that we have, we're in a little back chamber that's aluminum and we have two portholes we can see out of and we're really squished in. And there's a scientist and a pilot at the front of the submersible and they're in this big, huge plexiglass um, bubble. Um, at vulnerable, talk about vulnerable. They're in this big plexiglass uh, thing. And, and so the fellow, the engineer explains to me that we have a different atmosphere from the people in the bubble. And I say, why? And he said, well, so that if we die, they can still get it up. And if they die, we can still get it up. And then he says, now, if all three of us die and you're the only one left, here's how you get it up. And I'm <laughs> sitting there, and I believe I have never taken notes more carefully in my life. I was really, really engaged with this one, a little sweat on the brow, taking notes for this in the dark, right? And so, and, and then he, and then he, you know, they, they close the hatch, and he starts as we descend, he starts telling me about all the things that could go wrong. So, about, oh, there could be a fire, and I thought, oh, I'd forgotten to worry about that one. There, <laughs> I say, what if there's a leak? And I know, absolutely, that if there's a leak, we are dead. Like, we are instantly dead. There's not, it, it, we just, like, it's like a, a, you know, a laser goes right through you. Just, there, you, no hope, right? And I'm one of those people, I like to have a plan B. I don't know <laughs> if you're like this, but I just, I love to have a plan B. And I'm thinking to myself, there is no plan B here. At one point, I thought to myself, if I really get desperate, if I really, really, really get desperate, maybe I can convince that nice scientist in the front that she should take this submersible back up and not do her scientific research. And she's only going down for like three times in the whole year, right? Three holes, voyages. Maybe I can convince her that she should take me up. And then I realized that even the, the little mic that was connecting me to her was broken. So I, there was absolutely nothing I could do. So I just had to sort of relax and try to enjoy it, but I couldn't. I was just absolutely terrified. Until I got to the very bottom, and this is at 3,000 feet, and I'm told I'm the only journalist in the world who's gone that deep in a submersible, and I could be right, <laughs> hard to tell. Um, hardly anybody, hardly any humans in the history of humanity have been that deep, and nobody had seen this part of the ocean before. And I had an epiphany. And I'm going to read to you a little bit about the epiphany, and then I'm going to um, wrap up by reading you from the, the epilogue of the book, which, is, which takes hope a little bit further, I, ho I hope. So here I am, and I'm in the submersible at 3,000 feet, okay? My, my co-worker, the, the guy who's down with me, by the way, has been all this time reading a novel on the way down. <laughs> He's totally nonchalant. He's been down more than 650 times, and this is nothing to him, right? So here I am. The feeling of vulnerability is a thing alive. We four representatives of our voracious, casually destructive species are here in the belly of the planet's fundamental life force, at the mercy of a system we are only beginning to understand. We are immersed. There's no way out except back the way we came. We hit bottom, 3,000 feet. It's 5.9 degrees Celsius. The cold is viscous. The pilot turns on the xenon arc lights that illuminate the inky blackness for about 15 meters in front of us. We are at the bottom of a sheer-faced sinkhole in Tortugas Valley, beyond the continental shelf south of Florida. The wall in front of us runs straight up for 119 meters, stark as an iceberg. The scientists are hoping that this kind of wall will be prime real estate for deep sea sponges and sea fans, which is why we're here. Um, we are the first humans to see this, and perhaps the last. The engineer who's lying beside me has finally abandoned his novel. <laughs> 
It's pretty cool, he murmurs, it's pretty cool. I see hollows and crevices and animal boreholes in the wall in front of us and little shrimp poking their heads out of them. Right, the, the scientist I'm with says with disgust in her voice that the wall looks as though it's made of silly putty. She was hoping for a hard rock surface because her sponges like to attach to that. Life is everywhere. Over there, a field of tiny pink sea fans, an anemone, a pile of coral rubble. There, some eels, unidentified fish, a giant squid, crabs, a black lobster with eyes that glow eerily white. Some ancient brachiopods whose ancestors first appeared more than three billion years ago. A small fish swims past my head as I peer out the porthole. It is no bigger than my fingernail and delicate pink. All around us is the marine snow suspended as if in, in um, solution. The hand of Homo sapiens, Homo, sapiens, sorry, Homo sapiens is here but invisible. Even this deep, the fossil fuel-based carbon dioxide that we've pumped into the atmosphere can be tra tra tracked chemically. At this depth, salinity patterns have already changed. Um, from the melt in the glaciers up above, and the temperature of this water has already risen slightly. Like the rest of the planet's deep water, this batch the submersible is in right now is made up of water of different ages, created in all sorts of different places at different times. It is forever in motion, but parts of it are moving in different directions. As we forage around down here, we are literally moving across the dimension of time through past, present, and future water. And there's another layer of time laid over top of this. Some of the biological processes of this part of the ocean are local and immediate, like the plankton blooms at the surface, the day-to-day -day, um, fishing activity up above, um, and, uh, and some are tied to the ocean's seasonal cycles, some to annual patterns, and some to events that happen only once in several million years. It's like being immersed in the Australian Aboriginal concept of dream time, which is also known as any when when time ceases being a straight line or even a cycle and all time exists simultaneously. Before this, I've only understood this idea intellectually. And now I feel it, I live it. It is indescribably shattering. People who go to extreme environments, astronauts and deep divers, often report odd experiences. It has something to do with being pushed past a limit. Some become emotional, focusing on intensely personal issues, such as an unresolved relationship with a parent. Others turn to a religious faith, and yet others go on a surprising intellectual journey into the abstract. And this is where I have gone, um, deep into the theories of time and dimension. And now the epiphany comes. My fear vanishes, and so does my despair. I feel as though I have burst through this cramped space and out into the whole world. I'm flooded with hope with the sweet consciousness of the rich march of time, stretching from the deep past to the remote future, each moment containing all of the others. It is impossible to think only in the self-indulgent, despairing, fearful present when surrounded by life across these four dimensions. All this time, through all these journeys, I've been trying to reason my way to hope, to convince myself that hope is justified to build a case. It's been the question I asked all the scientists I met, in fact, hope just is. You can't run through a checklist to get to it. Yes, it is absurd and irrational, but like love, it is human. Like laughter, it catches and spreads. It works logarithmically, like the changes now underway on our planet, like our growing understanding of them, and like our powerful collective human ability to start coping with them. That doesn't mean hope is naive shivering in my undersea womb, peering at these wondrous ancient life forms, it occurs to me that we are in an era that holds out the potential of magnificent regeneration. We could, if enough of us wanted to, form a new relationship with our planet. We could become the gentle symbionts we were meant to be, instead of the planetary parasites we have unwittingly become. Perhaps this is the system switch that will be in the offing. Instead of the ocean lurching further, into an irrevocably altered state, maybe humans will irrevocably alter our relationship to it and understand that we must keep it healthy if we are to save ourselves. It is um, the point, as one of the scientists explained to me, is that biology, and that includes our species, is at work all the time. It is flexible, adaptable. It works in four dimensions all at once, breadth, width, depth, and time. It can always surprise us, can always do the unexpected. 
this is the ocean's prophecy. So I got up, and then I wrote the epilogue, and I'm going to read you a little bit from the epilogue, not the whole thing. And I call, this, I call this chapter a call for wisdom. Truth lies in the tales we tell rather than in the scientific facts that give rise to them. So understanding the meaning of the changes to the global ocean requires more than knowing that human activity is pushing the ocean's chemistry and biology toward a state it has not been in for millions of years. It takes stepping outside the science and into the curious realm of human psychology where the stories we weave around the facts are born. It is possible, for example, to look at what's happening to the global ocean and to conclude that it is insignificant, either because the science must be wrong or because humans simply can't have that much power over our planetary systems. It is possible to look at the facts and decide that the ocean will right itself without our help, possibly through an outside force swooping in, whether divine or technological or otherwise superhuman. This is one of humanity's most, most ancient and cherished stories and it runs through culture and time. Recent news accounts featuring the gover governor of Alabama praying for rain in the climate change parched croplands of his state are a really good example of this. A key belief underpinning this tale is that humans deserve salvation. Or here's another view, it's the guilt-ridden one. We may as well carry on as we are because we deserve to be annihilated for being such idiots. Or here's the story that the changes to the, the, the global ocean are so serious that they will kill us no matter what we do. So we may as well dance the merry jig of death, get on with it. This is the mentality that characterized the plague years in Europe during the 14th century. We're going to die anyway, so we may as well eat, drink, and spend as if tomorrow will never come. I'd like to suggest a different interpretation. Ocean change is extremely serious, and we have some power some power to halt or reverse it if we alter our actions rapidly, profoundly, and en masse. This draws on the archetypal human story that we can face the demons of the deeps, or journey to the underworld, or wrestle with the devil's temptations, or plunge to the psychological abyss, and come back to tell the tale. We can triumph, we can lead, we can heal. This is Odysseus, Aeneas, Hercules, Sinbad. It is the human epic. The story we tell matters because it alone determines the actions we take or fail to take. In other words, the final vital sign of the global ocean is how the agent of destruction, and that's us, will react. Will we turn the destruction off? Will we nudge towards our own self-destruction so that the earth can survive? Will we continue to attack the organism of the earth, pushing it into a new system that will be unlikely to harbor us? The problem of the atmosphere and the ocean is a problem of human behavior. I ran into a woman named Monica Sharma recently. She's a physician who works with the United Nations. And she delves deep into the human psyche to shift behavior on seemingly intract intractable problems, sorry, such as the practice of female genital mutilation and the spread of HIV AIDS. I, um, her view is that for transformation to happen, we first need to understand that transformation is possible. And for that to happen, we need to strip ourselves psychologically naked and figure out what each of us stands for. What is the story about the world that makes sense to us emotionally? What is it that we believe? What are we here for? Once we know that, we can start to ask the right questions, including what's missing. Answering that question leads to a course of action. So when Sharma sits down with religious and community leaders whose culture tells them that girls must be genitally mutilated, she doesn't judge them or tell them that they're wrong or tell them what to do. She asks them what they stand for. It takes days of deep discussion. It's very, very hard work. Once they can articulate where they stand or what their story is, she invites them to start asking questions such as whether a practice like female genital mutilation fits. If not, then why insist that it be done? She gives them the great gift of seeing the space between what they are and what they do. In many cases, these leaders go back to their communities and stop the harm to their children. A key to her success is that she doesn't give a prescription. Instead, she helps unleash imagination and creativity. In African communities, she and others have worked in, um, on the HIV AIDS issue. They've come up with more than 5,000 different ways to stop the spread of the disease. The power is in the lack of dogma, in starting with the story, in, on in honoring confusion, discomfort, and fear. Sharma refers to this as a call for wisdom. 
So here's my question at the end of this long journey. What do you stand for? What story do you tell yourself about why you're here? Perhaps you are a hero. It's clear the world needs heroes right now to ask what's missing and how that can be made right. I don't know exactly how the heroes will gather or how they will alter the course of the planet's future. Nobody does. We just know that it has to do with the, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But I know that if enough people are asking the right questions, we can make a start. This is a call for wisdom, not for logic. For hope rather than despair. It is about taking a stand and then acting on it, being fully human at a time when we need it most. There's another piece to this. <coughs> Many of the scientists I interviewed talked about the time frame of 2015 to 2030 as the drop dead point for action that is effective for halting the planet's course toward chaos. Others are clear that if the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere rises above 450 parts per million by volume, that will represent a point of no return. Today it is 387 and it's rising faster than at any time since humans appeared on the planet. If you believe that this matters and that something can be done, then the rest of the story reads that the time to act is right now. Thank you. Well, there is CO2 being released from the oceans in, in the process of primary productivity, but the oceans are much more a sink for CO2. So they store CO2 and then they, they store it and the, they take it in when they, when, for example, when phytoplankton photosynthesize, they absorb um, the sun's rays, photosynthesize, create carbon, emit oxygen, and then when they die, they the carbon goes to the bottom of the ocean. That's part of the biological pump. It will continue to absorb CO2. It does, it's, it's already started to um, absorb less CO2 than it used to because it's getting warmer. When the permafrost, permafrost and and the bottom of the sea are two different issues. There, there's methane at the bottom of the ocean and methane hydrates, and that's so it's just it's just solidified methane in a you know hydrate bubble, and and there is an issue of whether that will eventually, you know, rise to the surface. That's one of the theories behind the big the great warming 55 million years ago, and the it's called the it's called the um, PETM. So there is an issue about about whether that will happen. They're drilling in some cases for. Um, methane hydrates, which is incredibly uh, dangerous because that's a very, very volatile gas. And if it goes off, it'll be like a big belch that comes up from the bottom of the ocean and emits an enormous amount of carbon into the atmosphere very quickly. Methane is something like 22 times more potent a, a greenhouse gas than CO2. So that's that's one issue that's really important. And it's it's looming, but they don't know. They, they feel, scientists feel that if that did happen, it would represent a turning point, a tipping point, a point of, you know, where where exponential change would happen. So, but it's not clear that that will ever happen. The other issue you're talking about is permafrost. So they're in, in permafrost, like in the Arctic, um, there is a tremendous amount of methane stored. So as the permafrost melts, that methane is being released into the atmosphere. And again, it's one of the issues that, that scientists are worried about that uh, could, could present a feedback loop. So, so as more, met, more methane goes into the atmosphere, it warms up more quickly and it, you know, again, it's one of those uncontrollable climate change issues. So those are two separate issues, but it's, it's the same gas, which is methane. I think that we are at a critical time in the planet's history, I think demonstrably at a time of no analog in the, in the planet's history, and that we have a short window in which to deal with it. And what I find is that science has never been more important to human civilization um, than it is right now, and that, um, and that it's very poorly understood in general. So I think there's a real need for more um, 
explanation of the science and more, uh, demo to me it's about democratization of the information. There's all of this, scientists are the epidemiologists of our planet right now. And their findings are often poorly, re poorly, poorly funded, extremely um, poorly disseminated because of the systems that are already in place to, to try to support that. I mean, I, I knew scientists who were doing absolutely critical, critical research on the, the, on the planet who couldn't go on a research cruise for the, for the lack of $10,000, you know. Like, and that seems to me to be really insane. So that lack of communication runs at a bunch of different levels. It's not, you know, to me, scientists aren't, aren't necessarily, shouldn't necessarily be the communicators. I mean, it's fabulous when they are, but, Scientists have a whole range of skills that are critically important to just getting the, the basic primary information. And they need to be doing that. And this is, and never has it been more important. So people like me, yeah, I need to, you know, it's, it's important for, for people like me, but um, there are whole disciplines in some countries, like in Australia and in Germany, where you have PhDs in biology and in journalism, for example, so that, that you know, people are trained in both fields, which would be easier. I mean, I, mean, I schlepped around and, you know, j j uh, Scientists are very generous. They will explain very, very clearly what's going on, but it's, it's, you know, it's risky. There, there have only been five mass extinctions in the, on, in the planet's history. Um, there was one smaller one about 55 million years ago, but the big one, the big one was the last big one was 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs died out. The, um, the biggest of all was the Permian extinction, which was 250 million years ago. And um, that's when something like 95% of all the creatures on the planet, all the species on the planet died. So the characteristics of that were not only a more acidic ocean, but a warmer ocean and an ocean that lost its oxygen. So those would, I, you know, I would reasonably consider those warning, warning signs. Yeah, and it's over the, the history of the planet, so the 3.6 billion years of life. There have only been five, and we're setting the table for another one. What we're doing here is, a, is an enormous, enormous uncontrolled experiment, the gravity of which is becoming clearer every day. It's, uh, it's shocking. <laughs> Yeah, I'm focusing on the, the climate talks in Copenhagen in December. Yeah. I think really a lot has to happen at those talks and it has to be very distinct. So I think that you could, f I think it's legitimate in scientific terms to talk about that as a drop dead point. So if the climate talks in Copenhagen end without something very substantial, very, very substantial to follow Kyoto, something that is, you know, <laughs> in the order of 80% reductions by 2050, although I've heard 2030 as, 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 an, as a date to avoid catastrophic climate change. If something, if something really significant doesn't happen by, you know, by Copenhagen, I think we are really running out of chances. We've heard some hard messages tonight. And for me, the only thing I can do with that kind of message is use it in a motivational way. You know, if you don't hear the problem for what it is, you cannot construct the solution that's necessary. And rooms like this I really warm my heart because I know that you're all as crazy as I am. It's like you're interested in this, not just because it's interesting, but because it's compelling and something has to be done about it. And it was interesting hearing the com little conversation about population. You know, the 20 wealthiest percent of people in the world create 80% of the emissions. What that means in a thought experiment is if the poorest 80% of the world didn't wake up tomorrow, assuming things still worked, it wouldn't make any difference in solving that problem. Just cutting our emissions by 20% is neither here nor there at this point. We're looking at 80% this century, 90% for cultures like our own. So this is about us, not, all, not, not actually all humanity, but us, the people who live the way we do, the lucky ones, the privileged ones. So I really thank you for um, sticking with this problem, holding it in your heart, looking forward to solutions, and creating that vision of the life that you and I can wake up to every morning 
full of enthusiasm, using less than 10% of everything we used this morning. Thank you. Thank you.